kind of give you a um, a quick overview of of Camtasia. Um, <clears throat> and essentially, Camtasia is is software. It's very simple software, really, in principle, that collates recordings and lots of other media types and produces a video. So this is a video of a of a lab work, and this is the corresponding point in the Camtasia production suite. So you can see the video has a live recording. There's a person putting a cell into a UV spectrometer, and there's some overlay text and some other information. And you can see this here, how this is built up at this particular point in the in the timeline. And um, if we drill down a little bit, what well, the, the way it, the way it organizes is that Camtasia itself just is, is a compiler. So it just reaches out for files that exist in your system and compiles them. So it'll have a, what's called a media bin. And this is essentially all the bits of media that are going to go towards um, um, contributing to your video uh, in total. So there may be video, there may be audio files, there might be screen captures, images, lots of things. And then effectively you, you drag and drop these onto the timeline as you need. And you drag them in sequence, you can split this up and move things along and arrange things as you need. And then under share here, this menu item, you can just uh, produce. So if we just drill down a little bit further in the, in the, in the media, you can see it can get reasonably complicated. So um, we, we have, it operates on a layers principle. So anybody who's used, for example, the Adobe suite will know all about layers. And essentially, whatever whatever is uh, highest, so we have a series of tracks here, whatever is the highest track, that will be on top. So you see here, I have um, a bit of text here, direction of probe light, that's, that's probably this little piece of thing here, that, that's on top of the video. Obviously, if that was underneath the video stream, we wouldn't see it because the video is covering it. So we can very easily assemble on top of a video track, lots of additional annotations. And th this is probably why Camtasia is so popular over other screen recordings. It's very easy to add in text and additional pointers and even animations on top of the, the video recording um, in this kind of drag and drop uh, way. So the key thing about Camtasia is it allows us to prepare lots of media and then essentially assemble that media uh, in a timeline and then um, annotate that media with additional um, pieces of information. Um, and it can, it, can get, it can get quite complicated, actually. We can see here we have the, um, the timeline at the bottom with the video and audio embedded in one, with the university crest hiding somewhere, it's out of shot. Uh, and we have now a picture. So this, this, this third layer is a picture. So this is a picture of the cell setup. And then on top of that, you have annotations telling you which cell is which. And this is done really easily. All, all you need, obviously, are the media files, but the actual compilation uh, is really is really straightforward. So I, I've never done any training on Camtasia, as may be apparent in a moment, um, uh, but I've been using it for a long time, and it, it's a very intuitive, very user-friendly uh, piece of software. Um, to, one thing just to note, because it'll be important later, so this is the, the screen grab from the video I've just been showing you, and you see here that there's track one has a video stream, we know it's a video stream because we can see the little um, icon indicators. And on top of that is an audio stream. So this is where somebody has recorded a video and the video with audio is brought into Camtasia. So uh, track one contains both video and audio. Whereas in this case, uh, on the top layer, the audio is a separate layer. So this is where somebody has recorded uh, um, visuals and then separately recorded the audio and put that audio on top. And as we'll mention in a, in a while, um, there are pluses and minuses to, um, to do that. So the, what, what I want to dwell on now is, is, is um, the actual process of, of preparing videos. So, so that's kind of a very quick overview of Camtasia, but let's just think a little bit about um, preparing videos. So obviously, in terms of the video you're going to prepare, you need to think about what it is you're going to do. And it's very tempting to rush into the lab or rush onto the computer screen and start recording things. Um, but um, take it from my own experience of very bad practice, it's, it's much easier to plan out in advance and do what's called storyboarding. And storyboarding essentially um, starts to map out what the sequence of all these bits are going to be 
in, in, in a video. So for example, you might think about what are you going to have images and then PowerPoints and then some lab video and then back to PowerPoint and so on. Um, and therefore, what media components would you need to have ready to put in the media bin to, to drag into the compiler? What are you going to say? So um, issues associated with the, the script, what it is you're going to say. And one thing I'd like to emphasize here from the point of view of teaching videos is what do you want the viewers to do? So it's pretty easy and pretty straightforward to make demo videos. Um, I think you'll find that when you get going with this. But to make them a little bit more active, in other words, to get them that the students are actually doing things while they're watching it rather than doing things to prepare for something is a little bit more difficult. So all the time be thinking about when you're preparing what it is you want viewers to do. So a storyboard might look like, you know, you might say, okay, the introduction bit is going to be a PowerPoint screen recording what it is you want to cover. You'll need a script to go with that. And then maybe you'll have some prompt that you want the reviewers to know things in their lab book or something, something where you're going to say, this is a little bit of action you need to do here. And then it might move on to a lab bit where you maybe demonstrate some technique, in my case, spectroscopy or something like that. So that'll be a video recording with embedded audio. Um, you might be talking about the aims of the experiment and the script, and now you want the reviewer, the, the viewers to think, okay, so uh, what do you think would be useful here in terms of your own experimental analysis? So just all the time be trying to build in little, little rhetorical questions or prompts or what are called vicarious interactions um, for the students to look at. And then the next bit might be a PowerPoint um, screen recording. So something like I'm doing here, I am recording the screen as we're speaking. So um, this would be a screen recording, a, a media file that I could bring into um, uh, the, um, so, sorry, actually here I'm talking about a still image. So it may just be a still image um, that you are showing. So maybe it might be a picture of some experimental result, and then you have some audio explaining that. And then maybe again, prompt uh, um, the viewers to do something. So I'm, I'm just explicitly highlighting these bold blue points just because it's very often things we don't think about. And it's useful from a viewer point of view and really adds to the value of your view of your video if you are constantly thinking about the student point of view what it is you want them to do with this information as you present it so ultimately you're going to end up with a storyboard it can be as simple or as fancy as you like but essentially the task is to build up a picture an overall picture of what it is um, your video is going to present all right so um you now have a storyboard and there will, be, there will be bits and pieces you want to do. So obviously in lab videos, you'll want to record some live video. You may want to record some PowerPoint slides or some handouts. You might want to record some screen grabs or simulations or whatever. So the first thing that I just flag, and, and, and you are all much more expert in this than me, um, but of course you need to think about um, this um, essentially new additional aspect you're bringing into a laboratory. So do think about anything that may impact the health and safety of operation in the lab. You might be bringing in cables or even power sources, or you might um, ha need to um, have a flashlight or whatever it is. Just make sure that that's not going to interfere with the chemistry that normally happens in that lab. So just, just think carefully about what your setup will involve in the lab. And this could be something as simple as you will may need an extension cable to go across the floor to power something. Uh, and therefore you need to think about that in terms of other people in the lab. Um, in general, for, for working in labs with technological equipment, but especially in COVID times, you really need to think about the equipment you're going to be using and how it's cleaned afterwards. I'd suggest you let everybody in the lab know that a recording is happening, mostly so that they don't make any noise unnecessarily, but also just from a safety point of view. And just in overall, take your time to do careful and well-planned work. So very often um, it's tempting just to dive in and grab something that's color changing or something like that. Just, just make sure you're well-planned and everything's well-organized so you don't need to take any unnecessary risks. All right, so on, on to the actual recording itself. So I know many of you will be working in pairs. So you may have the last point here, which is a second person holding the camera. And, and that's probably the easiest setup because it means you can kind of move the camera around and um, get in close when it's necessary and pan back and so on. Um, do try and keep the camera movement smooth when you're doing that. Um, I have used tripods a lot in my own work. So um, you can buy cheap tripods. So this is essentially a normal tripod and then you can buy a little adapter uh, that, that clips onto the camera but screws onto the top of the tripod. They're pretty cheap in Argos. Um, 
in terms of the actual technology itself, I've been using my good old iPhone for a long time. Um, Samsung's and newer iPhones are just amazing in terms of the quality that that they that they produce. Um, so it's pretty pretty straightforward now to record to record videos. Um, the big question and the big question generally over and over again is audio. So in everything to do with, with making electronic resources, audio is the big issue. Um, and here we're looking at whether we record audio as we are doing the experiment or whether we do it afterwards. And, and there are advantages and disadvantages to both. So obviously if you're in a lab recording something and explaining it as you're doing it, that that's great. You know, you, it's very easy for the user to watch you doing something and talk about it as you're doing it. But there may be issues about noise. So you may need to think about fume hood noise. And of course we can't turn those off at the moment. Um, so, um, that, that can be difficult and it's also higher pressure on you as a presenter to make sure that you're getting getting things um, reasonably good um, in, in terms of reasonably good take. Um, so that's a, in, if that's the case, you're, the video that you produce will produce the video and will incorporate the audio stream. If you add it in afterwards, the pressure is off in terms of recording and that it would just need to record the visuals. Maybe you can talk it as you're doing it, but you're not going to use that audio stream. And then you have to post hoc uh, record the audio. For example, you can just use the voice recorder on your phone and um, bring that in as a separate file. Um, that does allow for more, contro more control. It is definitely more time consuming. And also there's a slight problem I'll mention later as well of you becoming a BBC4, BBC Radio 4 presenter where you become very formal. So I know here I'm speaking reasonably casually, I hope, but when I'm re when I'm recording and reading off a script, I end up, I just turn into this monotonous robot and it's or even more so. It's quite difficult to, to keep it lively. So just think about the pros and cons. Um, if you can, I would do in, I would do just live audio and video at the same time. It just saves a lot of time. Um, and then there's a minor task of getting the videos from whatever you've recorded it to the PC. Uh, so I usually just transfer them to Dropbox, but you can use any kind of file sharing, or if you can just hook your, if you can find the phone cable, just hook your phone to the cam, to the laptop or PC. Um, don't do what I've done here, uh, which is just random file names. Do try and name them sensibly and consistently. And this is especially important in shared projects and in resources that we may, we may, uh, that may be used by other people in the future. So it's okay for me in a way because I am able to spend hours searching on my laptop for that one file that I had downloaded somewhere. Um, but that's obviously going to be impossible if these batch of files that we produce are going to be shared, for example, with Matthew as course organizer, and he's going to bring them forward and they might be reused in later years. Just try and think about the sustainability of the files in terms of their file names. And a really important thing, as I mentioned at the start, Camtasia doesn't actually host these files, it just compiles them from where they are located. So if you are trying to compile something and where you have told Camtasia the file is, if the file location changes, well then Camtasia won't be able to find that file. It will prompt you to ask you for it, but if you don't know where it is, um, that, that, that project essentially is, is uh, wasted. So this is basically saying, uh, organize your files. Um, Okay, so that's live recording. We can do the same thing with recording the screen. So effectively, when you open Camtasia, it'll ask you, do you want to um, produce? So bringing up the screen I showed at the start of the talk or record, bringing up this little um, box that'll hover in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. And um, you can screen record anything. So I've screen recorded PowerPoints, obviously. Uh, Camtasia will actually add in a plugin to PowerPoint um, so you can activate it directly there. I recommend activating it via the Camtasia rather than through PowerPoint. Sometimes there are bugs coming through PowerPoint. But you can record, for example, if you had some simulation and you wanted to record that or some molecule rotation or whatever it is you want to record that's happening on your screen, you can record that. So it's really good. Um, so all you have to do is essentially press the record button. Um, the recorded inputs, again, you can choose whether or not you want to record audio as your as your presenting the screen, and obviously that's advantageous. You can choose whether or not you want to have your webcam on. In general, we don't um, do that um, for lab pre-lab videos. Uh, we tend to rely on the person in the lab being the kind of human face of all of this. Um, you also need to think about the dimensions. So here you see I can select the area, 
So I can select full screen or I can select just a part of the screen. That doesn't really matter once it's bounding whatever it is you want to record. But the really crucial thing is are the dimensions. So you should always lock this box to make sure that the dimensions stay in the same ratio. And then make sure that you're at least 1280 by 720. Okay, so 1280 by 720, and I'll share these slides afterwards, obviously, mean that you will always be in the correct dimension so that the video, the screen video you record um, is in widescreen and is of sufficient um, quality to be high definition. And you see here, here, here is a video that hasn't done that, where, where the screen setting has just banded the PowerPoint, but this isn't 1280 by 720, so we get what's called black bars on either side. Not a major issue, but it's just a bit of a pity because, of course, we could have filled the full width of the screen here. And as I mentioned, you can decide whether or not you want to record the audio separately or in parallel. Okay. Um, one thing to note that's quite useful about screen recordings, and that is that Camtasia has this, what's called a, what they call a zoom and pan feature, or basically a zooming feature. So here's a video I made just this week, actually, and you can see I'm recording an entire Excel sheet. But there's a point where I need, really need to zoom in and show the user something. So I'll show you how to do it in a while. But you can essentially just just zoom in and tell Camtasia to to essentially just take a fraction of the screen, and when it's producing it, just just produce that as the full screen. So it's very useful. And the pan feature means you can move from one part of the screen to another in a kind of a nice um, um, smooth way that that does it automatically. So this means that even though you might be recording a very large area. In production phase, you can actually just focus in on a narrow area for the for as long as you like, for the whole video or for part of the video or whatever. Um, so that's quite useful. All right, so I'm just going to mention briefly that that um, especially in terms of recording um, PowerPoint files and, and um, uh, materials that aren't live videos, they're screen captures or whatever. There's a lot of um, education literature on on e-learning and how people learn using computers. And when people learn com using computers, they tend to learn by, or they tend to view that material or they tend to hear the material. So we need to think about how people are hearing and how people are seeing. And Richard Mayer is an educational psychologist who does a lot of work in this area. And he summarized a whole load of principles. So obviously there's far too many to go over here in detail. Um, but these essentially summarize the kind of things you should think about when producing especially PowerPoint slides. Now I'm breaking many of the rules here myself, um, but um, I'm just gonna flag a few of them. Um, th to be honest, they're mostly very obvious, but they're just a couple of things that, that are useful. So I'm just gonna flag one or two of them. So the first one is what's called the contiguity principle. And this just this essentially says, if, you're, if you are, for example, you have some graphic or some molecule that you're talking about or some detail about a chemical experiment or something, put the words, um, near the corresponding graphics. So this graphic here is actually the result of this research study that showed that students in this very simple situation where they had a nice graphic and very clear instructions or where the text was cl more clearly associated directly with the graphic, students in the second scenario were much more able to recall and describe the experiment in the second scenario. And the reason really relies on, it comes back to this contiguity principle is to do with how people process information. It's much easier to integrate this information simultaneously than it is this, because in the first case, the students are looking at the test tube and looking down at the, the text back up and so on. Whereas here, everything is in the same place. So in general terms, here's another example. Um, uh, this is where in, in this first case, the information is split by space. So we have the graphic on top and the text on the bottom. In the second case, the information is split by time, so that one slide has the graphic and the next slide has the text. And again, when viewers are on the second slide, they've got to be mentally thinking about the first slide, so therefore it's taking up some what's called working memory capacity. Whereas a better way of representing um, slides one and two here will be in this combined slide where we have the, um, the visual, some key text, and the rest of the text presented verbally. And this comes down to what's called the redu redundancy principle. And that is we tend to only put key text on PowerPoint slides and knowing that the learner will be able to listen, most of the text goes as audio. So you shouldn't fill your slides with, um, with lots of text. The only information you want on slides are the key texts that you really want learners to take away. So obviously there's, you know, this, this is very, um, this gets very detailed very quickly, but I just want to flag to you these kind of, these kind of principles. Another one in relation to, to graphics is you should think 
So this is essentially the modality principle, thinking about the mode of how people learn. They can learn by listening and they can learn by seeing. So this is the idea that you should present information about a graphic verbally and then just put the key text in. Uh, the embodiment principle is something that a lot of my organic colleagues I'm sure will agree with and that is that it's quite difficult to learn if you just have lots of beautiful reactions on the screen, but much easier to see the expert drawing those out and talking out their understanding as they're drawing. So the embodiment principle is essentially saying, um, it's essentially giving the learner the opportunity to see the expert write out something and think about and talk out what they're, what they're thinking. Um, signaling principle basically says on this screen you're looking at lots of things. So if I was to go back to the previous screen, for example, you're looking at lots of things. And if I was just talking, it's quite hard to know what part of the screen I'm talking about. Whereas if I can have some highlighting box or something that's saying something that's hovering over redundancy principle, then that's signaling to the learner this is the bit of the graphic I want you to think about in this moment. All right. So 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 they're linked to that to that website there if you want to um, if you want to have a look at those, but. The ones I've mentioned are probably the most important. Essentially, minimize the text you have on screen and always associate the verbal text you have with the graphic that's represented on the screen. Um, you may have other media, so you may wish to prepare graphics or download images or whatever. Um, so do just, if you do, just make sure um, uh, for the official record that um, you have permission um, to use those and you should at least acknowledge the source. Um, we are um, now legally obliged, as well as being generally morally obliged, to make sure that all of our materials are accessible. So therefore, we need to think about the subtitles or the captions. Now, I, I personally host a lot of my videos on YouTube, and YouTube miraculously is able to translate my um, spoken word into, into um, text, and it's generally quite good. Um, but you can upload the transcript to YouTube or we will probably be hosting these videos on Media Hopper, which is essentially the, the university's YouTube. That means we can keep it behind the uh, Ease uh, login and you'll need to upload the transcript. Now, if you're, if you're looking carefully, you might have spotted that in the top right-hand corner here, if I just go back to um, my desktop, there's, um, uh, if I stop sharing, you'll see in the top right-hand corner, live on otter.ai notes. And there it is a, a, an option to, um, to stream the text. So Otter is a really good, um, I'll just share the uh, screen again. So Otter is a really good um, piece of software that is uh, good at transcribing. And I'm suddenly very self-conscious of talking because it, as it's transcribing live. And I found this pretty good. Uh, you have to go back and even with my weird accent, I found less than 10% um, accuracy. You see what happens is actually quite clever. It, 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 it thinks about each word in the context of the rest of the words in the sentence. And what you can do is then, if you have an Otter account and it's free and you get pretty generous allowances, you can download this as just a text file without the, without the timestamps and everything. And then that becomes a text file that you can, um, that you can, uh, sorry, I'm not sure if we're sharing that, that you can um, use um, uh, to upload as transcripts. All right. So let's just go back to the, um, Presentation, nearly there. Um, so I mentioned that you know you can type out a script and use that to narrate. Uh, I have found that as somebody who tends to think a lot in the spot, um, actually saves time in the long run, um, but you just need to be careful about the BBC effect um, and, and Otter perhaps is a good, a good middle ground. All right, so I thought we might just do a run through of some live um, examples and practice as to how it might look. But I suppose the main take homes are, you wanna make sure you get all your media ready. So that's gonna be the hard part. Okay, so Camtasia is really quick and easy if you've got everything ready to go and you know what it's meant to look like. Um, so you start Camtasia and bring in the bits of media as you, as you need to. And then in this order, and this is really important, um, get the visuals right. So if you have visuals and audio separate, work on the vid visuals, make sure that sequence is exactly as you want, because that's the hardest to change afterwards. Then bring in the audio, or if that's already there with the visual, make sure that's aligned. And again, there's a little bit of work on that. And then check that. And just check that the visual and audio is exactly as you want it. And then you can start playing around with some post-productions. Now with four and five, you need to be very careful that you don't end up spending hours and hours on just those final little tweaks. Okay, just decide what it is you want at a basic level to make these videos understandable, 
do it and move on. Okay, it's very tempting to just nudge things left and just add in one more thing. Um, really, the end effect is is minimal. So just do it, do it cleanly and and, and smoothly, um, and hopefully post production won't take too long. So after you have the visual and audio set, you should do any zooming and panning. So if you need to zoom in on parts or move move around the screen or whatever, that's the next phase. All right. And the reason that you must get the audio and visual set up first is that if you subsequently cut a bit of audio or visual out, that will distort the zoom and pan. It'll move it, and then it'll be it'll be out of sequence and so on. Then once you've got that sorted, that's essentially an add-on to the visual. Um, you can add in any callouts, so highlights or spotlights or whatever. So that that signaling principle. I really want you to look at this part. So as you'll see, Camtasia has some nice ways of doing that. Or you can highlight, spotlight, blur, whatever it is you like, and then r run it through again. Make sure you're happy, and then press produce to produce an MP4 file and upload it to, um, I guess, Media Hopper. Um, so I've just listed some tips here, but I'll go through these uh, in more detail when I just do the demo. And, and I suppose the first thing and the most difficult thing is good audio. And um, I mean, I bought this headset, it's a Logitech headset a while, well, about 10 years ago, and it's just about still struggling. Um, if you're recording audio separately, to be honest, um, a phone is probably the best. It, it records very clear, sharp audio, and you can ex export the audio MP3 file very easily. Um, so just do a quick check on whatever it is you're going to do in terms of recording audio, run it through the entire process and make sure it comes out at the end that um, I'm re looking, looking okay. So just do a, do a check on 30 or 40 seconds of audio in whatever recording setting you're going to do and make sure that's right. Of, from, a learn, from a viewer point of view, you, viewers will, will put up with pretty much anything, but poor audio is extremely disturbing to listen to. So make sure you get that right. Um, as you'll see, Camtasia, Camtasia has audio enhancements. So if, if the problem is just volume, for example, it's very easy to increase that. Um, you can, if there's sharp noises or somebody screams or baby wails in the background or whatever it happens to be, you can mute those out very easily. Um, there is a noise removal function. For example, if you had a fume hood noise going constantly in the background, it is possible to remove it. It does mean this subsequent voice um, can become a little bit clipped and electronic sounding, um, but sometimes it works okay. So again, it's just worth doing that initial test. Um, and then the part three are, are things I'm going to go through in, in a little bit detail in the, in the demo, but there's just some tips of the tricks of the trade in, in lining up audio and visual. O obviously, if you record audio and visual simultaneously, it removes a lot of need for this. And as I mentioned, keep the production approaches um, uh, simple and consistent. All right, so that that's the um, that's the uh, a bit on um, the how it works. But I just thought I'd just go through those tips and tricks um, um, in terms of what what a what it might look like. And again, it, you know, it's, it's quite hard having never used a program to, to to take all this in. But this is really just to give you kind of a quick overview as to what it looks like in. Um, in terms of editing a video, so I'm just going to go through some some bits very briefly in the in the order that you would that you would do them. So you see here in my in my media bin, I brought in lots of bits of media, and I've added those to the timeline, and I've assembled them and I've started to compile them. So let's just say I'm I mean this this isn't real, but let's just say I'm going to do a little bit more. So sometimes, for example, I might want to put in a an image. So I've, this this track one here is a um, video track that has audio embedded, and I might want to put in an image between, between say, um, 47 seconds and 48 seconds. So I can just click on that um, bit of the track. It's already been split, so that's why it's just a yellow box around here. And I can choose to uh, split it, and maybe I don't want this part. Actually, that's just going to be redundant, um, so I can delete that. And Whatever image I want to bring in, I can bring that image in and fill the space. So now, if I look at the preview, that preview is going to go from the video into this image, and then back to back to the video again. If I wanted to, um, uh, so that's uh, splicing the timeline. Um, the next thing is you see here in this in, in this bottom stream, as I mentioned, the video and the um, 
audio are the same. We can we can disentangle those, so we can right click on the that video section and separate audio and video. So if, for example, here this was a bit of video where you just want the students to watch something, but you wanted to add in additional audio afterwards, so this is actually just dead noise. Well, we could we could separate audio and video. You see, it pushes the audio up to the track above. If you wanted to get rid of that, we could just press delete to delete it uh, and, and paste in some new audio in that section, or we can play around with it. So, so we can easily dis disentangle the, the audio and the, um, the video stream. While we're in audio, and we can do this when audio is embedded in the video or when audio is on its own, the audio effects allow us to do a couple of, a couple of things. So we can just see when I'm clicked on the track, uh, there's a green bar, and that effectively is the volume level, so I'm able to increase and decrease that as I need. So if you had uh, a cat meowing here or something and you really wanted to just get rid of that little bit, you could splice it either side and then just reduce the, bit, the volume there to zero. Uh, overall, you can add in a volume leveling. So this is, this is useful where you may have some sections on PowerPoint and some sections on live video, and you want the volume to be uniform throughout. Well, you could you could um, just click on volume leveling, and you see it just essentially drag and drop, and the blue bars are telling you where you can bring that to. And we can, if you just drag that over, it'll it'll make sure that all the all the volume throughout the video is the same. That usually isn't necessary. Noise removal, as I said, is quite good, um, but it can it can distort the the uh, audio. All right. Um, there, there is this clip speed, and this is quite fun. So you may have a bit where you want to um, just do a very, so for example, I have some videos where I'm watching a kinetic decay, and we're just watching the UV vis curve decay over time. You can just put, put clip speed over and say, actually, I want, um, I need to go to the properties on the right-hand side here. I don't know if you can see it, clip speed. I can just change the speed here to be one by, I can change it to be whatever value I want. And that'll just essentially compress, let's say we make this, uh, 10 times by, you see it'll compress the video. So now as that's, as we played through that video, if you watch the top part of the screen, it's just very, it's, it's very quickly gone through that section. So this can be useful for uh, time lapses or whatever. Let's undo that. So control, uh, edit undo is uh, obviously a useful feature. Um, audio properties, extend the frame is also useful. So for example, if you had a little bit of audio and you spoke for too long, but the video has gone on, you can just move all the all the video bits along, okay? And if you right click here, you see I can extend frame. So I could extend that frame by any number of seconds I want, so let's type in 10. So it's telling me the gap here isn't, isn't big enough, so I'd have to move those on a bit more, so let's just make it six. So I've extended that frame by six seconds, and then I can just put everything up again. Um, obviously we can cut out things. So um, if this was a bit that I didn't want anymore, I could just cut that out. So I can highlight, so I've clicked here, click and drag, so it highlights it, just cut, and that's gone. Um, a really useful feature is, especially if you have disconnected audio and video, is sometimes this bit here might be excess audio. So maybe it's the bit of audio trailing when you finished, but it's still in a recording, but you, you don't want the corresponding visual, you can lock a track. So if I locked all of these tracks apart from the audio, so I'm just turning on the padlock here, so the, the, the audio track padlock isn't locked, and I just wanted to delete that part. Okay, so I'm cutting again, but now it's only gonna cut the, let's, let's move it into the middle. Now it's only gonna cut the bit of audio from that track, everything else stays, stays safe. So that's, that's, that's quite handy. And then lastly, zoom and pan. So on, up here under um, animations, you see there's animations and zoom and pan. The zoom and pan, we need to unlock the um, tracks to see zoom and pan. You can see this is where we can just zoom in and say, yeah, we really want to, we really want to, I don't know what it's gone upside down, zoom in on that part. And you can see these little arrows have moved in so the video will go from the, um, it'll, it'll zoom right in. And then if you wanted to zoom back out again, you just, um, well, you can just say scale to fit and it'll zoom back out to the full, the full uh, piece. All right, not quite sure why that's gone reverse, but such is the fun of e-learning. 
All right. Um, so once you've done all that, you've got your audio done, your visual done, your zoom and pans done, stop, check everything's okay. And now you can start to add in any additional annotations. So here I have my video. I've overlaid a picture of what the person doing the demonstration is looking in at. And I've overlaid that with two reference arrows. So the picture is easy. We just go to media and we can just drag in a picture wherever it is we want to see it. So let's say we want to have a picture on top of the track here. Doesn't matter what track I put it in once it's over the video stream. All right, so I'll just move to that point in the line. So let's just say we want that here or we can we can rescale it. So it's very, very straightforward. And then maybe we want to annotate that so we can add in lots of different types of annotations with lots of different callouts. So plain text right through to a whole lot of different options and you can style these colors once you click on them. So if I click on box here, for example, uh, over in the right hand side, the, the, the options here allow us to choose colors and font and whatever it is we want. There are arrows, uh, um, lots of weird shapes. Um, there's um, something that's quite handy is um, you can blur parts or spotlight parts. So if you really want people to look at what this person is doing with their hands, you can put a spotlight over it. So that's signaling and so on. Um, and then you have this beautiful video, spent hours on it and you're ready to go. Play it through one more time, make sure you're happy with it and then go share local file. And there'll be lots of options here and I recommend you choose MP4 only and then this 1080 will give us the high definition. Uh, press next. It'll ask you whether you want to organize it into subfolders. You don't need to do that because you've only got one file, the MP4. Okay, if you had to choose another option where you have, for example, table of contents or quizzes or whatever, you would need all the content in a subfolder, but you can just uncheck that, note where it's going and press finish and your computer will start making very loud noises and spend about, uh, well, it depends on the video length, but this video here, uh, about two minutes will take about two or three minutes to produce and then you have an mp4 file and that is pretty much Camtasia in uh, 40 minutes. So let me just um, stop recording.